Welcome back to MVM. We have a Kickstarter preview today for a great little game called Forbidden City. This is from Andreas Stedding. If you don't know that name, he designed Hansa Teutonica. If you haven't played that, get out and play it. This is also from Game Brewer, who yeah. last year released one of my top 10 games of the year, Pixie Queen. And I gotta say, we play a lot of Kickstarter games, and this one is definitely in our wheelhouse. It is yeah. a Euro game, and it's based on the Ming Dynasty. You are representing Chinese families who are trying to bribe city officials. Yeah, it was, and, and the way they did it back then yeah. was you had you would give them something of great value, like a jade amulet or a, a jade ring or statue, and to kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge at the person, you'd give them like a piece of paper back saying, yeah, we're just exchanging gifts. Yeah. But you're actually bribing the person. Yeah, it was really interesting because they'd actually outlawed yep. paying money, so then they just kind of went to the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Right, so each player is representing one of these families trying to bribe one of the seven different city officials. Now, the board is actually broken into seven different regions, and you have all these regions where you're gonna be basically using one of your cards that you're starting with to take the action of that spot and then grabbing that new card to be able to use in a future round. What's really cool is that each of these different spots have their own ability, as well as the different cards. Several of these cards will have a ability across the bottom that also allows you to take the action there. Now there's a variety of things that you can do when you place these cards on the actual board. Let's talk about the components first yeah. and then we'll get into the gameplay. So the main thing that you saw, uh, that you see right here is the actual game board itself. The game board, as we said, is broken into seven different regions. You have a region where you're gonna travel, you have the Great Wall, you have the Jade Market, you have the actual palace, you have a place full of intrigue, it's kind of like a journey track that's also a tiebreaker within the game. You have a, a number of different decrees. decrees, yes, that you can become a part of to give you either beginning of the round abilities, ongoing abilities, or even end of the game abilities. And then across the bottom you have the canal. This is a place where you're going to use your ships in order to get really huge benefits through the course of the game. Each player is also going to have a player board in front of them. This player board has a, a number of different areas. In the bottom middle is going to be your end of the game scoring. So it's basically only used to tell you how to score your in-game victory points. Across the top, you're going to track all of your travel tokens. Anytime you gather one of these tokens, you're going to take the ability and then slot them in these from left to right. Again, you can turn these in to get special abilities through the course of the game. On the left hand side, these are three different abilities that are tied in directly to the canal. And over here on the right hand side, you have a place for all of your discarded or used cards, and then a place for all of your servants, because everyone's going to start the game with six servants, which are the cubes. Yeah, and the other thing that has to be mentioned about this player board, it has literally all the information you need to yep. play this game. Once you've read the rules, great iconography that walks you through every step. Yeah, because each of the different rounds, and there's four rounds in the game, are going to take place over three three different phases. You have a morning phase, a day phase, and then a night phase. Each of these phases are going to either seed or set up the board for the next round, uh, kind of reset the board for the so the end of the round, and then also you have the middle section, which is the day section, which is the majority of the actions you're going to take round after round. The game is going to take place over four rounds, and that's shown by the top of the board here. Each of these rounds is going to allow you to collect for free some servants back into your supply to be able to use. And each player is going to start with four cards. Now, the cards are the most important thing that you can that we can discuss. In yeah, this these game. are the gifts. We're not going to talk about all of these. However, the cards range from number one through nine. And depending upon your turn order in the game, you're going to start with a very specific hand of cards. And the reason for that is because some of the cards, as you progressively go down from first player to last player, give you higher numbers and they give you more abilities. Yeah. And the reason for that is because you're starting later in the round. However, what you start with will not be the cards that you have the next round because every time you play a card, you're taking a card. It's a really cool dynamic. Yeah, the cards just basically are an exchange system here where you're going to get cards on the board. Someone else might take a card you just played and have that in their hand for the next round. There's a lot of gameplay here, so we're not yeah. going to talk about everything, but we will talk about how you set up the board. So. At the start of a round, you're basically going to see the board, and this is done at the very first turn of the game. You have all these different travel tokens up here. These are abilities that you're allowed to take your traveler to be able to take special abilities. Anytime these are missing, you're going to reseed these at the beginning of the board, at the beginning of the round. You're also going to roll these three dice, which we did not mention. These dice have numbers on them that correlate to the cards that you're going to be using in the game as well. 
These are going to be uh, accounted for at the end of the round. However, at the beginning of the round, you're just going to roll them and place them there in whatever number shows. You know, it's interesting because at the end of the round, you're going to look at those, and that's going to determine some extra workers or extra servants that you can get back into your pool. So what that means is during the round, you can actually take those numbers into consideration as you're placing your gifts, because if you take gifts into your discard pile, if mm -hmm. you will, that match those numbers, you're going to get more and more extra servants for the following round. Also, each player who has ownership of the two level one decrees, now over here on the side of the board, you have level one, level two, and level three decrees. These are pulled randomly from a huge stack of decrees that you see here that are gonna be used. These are the same decrees from the beginning of the game to the end, so these are just gonna be taken off, give some vari variability in yeah. the game. However, at the start of each of these rounds, if you have ownership in any of the level ones, they give you morning abilities, either moving tokens around or gaining some kind of resources at the start of that round. Yeah, the level ones and the level twos, for the most part, have ongoing abilities that will trigger throughout the game or benefit you, whereas the level threes are end of game scoring usually. The meat of the game is using your cards. Now, these are basically your actions within the game. Everyone starts with four, and as you notice across the top, as we said, they all have numbers on them, ranging from the number one through the number nine. Also, they can or may not have abilities on the bottom of them. On your turn, you're simply taking one of the cards in your hand and you're replacing a card on the board. Again, there's seven different zones, so you can choose any one of these seven zones that you wish, but there are some rules that you have to follow. Number one, if you place it in an area and the number is higher than that area, guess what? You're in luck. You get to not only take the action of the card, but you also get to take the action of the spots. Right. You're going to put that card there, and then you're going to take the one that you replaced and put it in discard. That means in a future round, that card you take is now going to be part of your future hand. If that number that you replaced is equal to or less than, you have some things that you have to decide right then. Number one, in order to take the action of either the spot or the card, you have to give up two servants. So you have to have two servants in your supply. If you don't, you're out of luck. The second thing you could possibly do is take a different card from your hand and place it face down, meaning that you don't get to take one action that round. Yeah, that's a huge giveaway because effectively you have four actions per round mm -hmm. as a base level. There is an option to get more cards to give you more actions, but usually you have only four. So if you give up one of those cards, that's 25% of your actions during yeah. any given round. The last thing you can do, say you don't have two servants to pay, nor do you have a card that you want to give up, you simply can take that card that you replaced, put it face down, and then completely waive your ability to take any actions in that spot, both the card and the ability of this specific spot. Yeah, that too can be significant. However, like Jeremy said, some of the cards don't have actions on them. So if you're just looking to sort of power up your hand for the following round, you might be able to dump a card that doesn't have an action, forego any of the actions, and then just have a nice a higher value card for the next round or whatever card you might want. And you're going to go around the table until everyone is out of cards. Once that happens, you're going to go to the night phase. Now, we'll talk about the night phase in a moment, but we're not going to talk about all the different actions here, but let's talk about what you're sure. trying to do. Like, there's a lot of different things going on in this game. So, the first thing you have to know before, before you, whatever you're going to talk yeah, about, yeah. By the end of the game, by the end of four rounds, you have to make sure that your envoy, which is in the palace, progresses up these stairs to get to the, the throne room, basically. Exactly. That's the one place that you can't ignore yeah. for the rest of the game. There are things that you don't have to do. You, many different players are going to play this game differently and score their points differently. But like Jeremy said, absolutely, you must get your envoy up to the top here. If you have twice as many points as everyone else at the end of the game, but your envoy isn't at the top, you lose. Yeah, you score zero <laughs> points. Also, this is kind of a race to be able to get up here. It's not going to end the game for anybody, but the first person is going to be able to occupy the first area, giving them more points than people that come into that throne room later. Also, once you hit this throne room, every time you were to progress up, additionally, you get more victory points, which is fantastic. Yeah, so that's the main spot we definitely want to talk about yeah. because you have to do that. But there's a number of other spots. We'll just kind of generalize what you do here. One of the easier ones, and I think a pr pretty significant one, all of them are pretty significant, mm -hmm. but the one where you travel up here at the top, you're simply going to take this action. You have two options. You can... Uh, either move your traveler one space, or if it's your first time doing it, yep. you simply put them out there on the board. Wherever you place them, or wherever they finish, you're going to take that token. And the tokens have a variety of different yeah. benefits, some of which are basically repeats of some of the same things you'll do in other uh, regions of the yep. board. Um, you can do that, or you can give up 
two of your servants, and you just simply take those off your board and set them aside, and instead you can move twice. And that doesn't mean move twice and take that last action. It means move once, take that token, yeah. move another time and take that token. So yeah. you get those abilities. Those tokens, like we said earlier, go across the top of your board, and those can be traded in for a variety of different things throughout the game. The great thing about the travel spots, too, is you're going to skip over any empty spots and any other player that's in that location. So you're always able to move around and grab the things that you wish to grab. That is nice. This is the Jade Market. Anytime you go to the Jade Market, you're allowed to buy Jade, so to speak. And they are cheap in specific locations. Then you have this giant supply, which costs more. These are all end of the game victory points, which are shown on here. So it's kind of a set collection through the course of yeah, the game. Yeah, the more you get, the more those ramp up. And then there may be other things in the game that give you extra points on one of the decrees if it happens to be out there. These two areas, one is the Intrigue Track and one of them is the Great Wall, kind of work together. The Great Wall, you are building in unison with your cubes that are in your supply. Once you reach a threshold, depending upon the number of players, you actually get to build that great wall section. And that's simply signified by being able to grab some victory points and being able to move up your envoy and then also being able to remove some of your intrigue that you've gained through the game to be able to get additional abilities. So these two kind of tie into one another. Yeah, it's really cool because the great wall is kind of like an area majority. Everyone can contribute, but whoever has the most gets the big reward from that spot. But then everyone who contributed, no matter how few of your servants, you get to do that intrigue move and tr potentially trade in some of that intrigue. We already talked about the decrees, but once again, these give you either uh, beginning of the round abilities, ongoing abilities, or end of the game victory points, depending upon which ones that you control. There's a really cool dynamic in this as well. The players that go here early are spending less servants and less resources to be able to buy into these. So if you go there late, you're gonna be paying a little bit more for them. You can spend quite a few servants if you go there late and some of the level threes, uh, they cost three in and of themselves. So you might be spending four five or six servants to get those locations. The last one is the canal. We're not gonna go into too much depth. However, it is tied to the left side of your board. There's three main bonuses you can get from being able to manipulate your ships on the canal. Uh, using your ships is going to permanently remove one of your 12 servants for the rest of the game. Yeah. So it's a give and take. However, you can get uh, four victory points three times. You can get two extra cards, meaning you have more actions to use for the rest of the game. Or you can get your foreman, which is a two block, which is great because he only costs one servant to be able to move around, but he occupies two spaces. So you have a little more flexibility yeah. from using him from round after round. So without getting into all the details of the game, I have to say there's a lot of cool things going on in this game. And we're not going to review it because this is a Kickstarter. However, it's pretty close to being finished. Yeah. One of the things I love is that there's a lot of variability everywhere you go. How you approach this game is completely up to you. We all played very, very differently. Not only that, but there's a ton of options up here in the travel because they all come out randomly as well. Like you can choose how you want to approach it, how you want to manipulate your servants. And the servants are awesome because you have to pay very close attention to your servants. Because if you come into a round and you only have two or three servants, even with four cards, you're gonna be hard pressed to be able to do anything on the board. Yeah, and there are things you can always do. That's the one thing I'd like to say about this game is, while it feels uh, somewhat intense in terms of like your ability to get things done, it's really uh, what feels like a very short game, four rounds with four cards each effectively. That's not many turns to take throughout the game. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of things that you wanna to try to consider doing. With that said, there's a lot of things they've done here that make it feel a little bit more free than other games. For instance, what we mentioned earlier about the traveling up here. Mm -hmm. The fact that instead, when, when spaces get empty, you don't actually have to waste your movement into those empty spaces. The fact that they've made the rules so that you can actually just move all the way to the next token makes it feel a little bit more liberating to go up there knowing that if you move twice, you're gonna get two tokens. Yeah, the other great thing too is the board is completely dynamic too. By placing a card on there, and then taking that new card, you've created a new spot that someone can actually use. Or not. Able, or not, <laughs> in, in very specific cases. Now we completely uh, glossed over the end of the round. So let's talk about that real briefly before we wrap oh, yeah. up. So once all the players are done taking all their actions, you have a night phase. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna reveal all the cards that you had in your dis discard pile. And you're gonna look at those numbers. And those numbers you're trying to match up with those three dice numbers that you show there. This is going to allow you to gain more servants for the beginning of the next round. The person who matches the most of them also is going to get some victory points and again be able to move up their envoy higher up in the palace. You're also going to move the ships one space forward. So there's a, again, there's a lot of different things going here, a lot of different things that you have to think about round after round. 
Yeah, there's like the number of points that you can get in a number of different ways. And we see that in a lot of euros. And in this one, it wasn't very easy to recognize that at first glance. Mm -hmm. But as we played it, it definitely was there. Like there are things that I didn't do at all in my game. I didn't uh, benefit at all once from the canal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but ended up scoring just as many points as anyone else by doing other things. It was yeah. really, really cool. Fantastic game. If you guys are interested in medium to maybe a little bit heavier. Yeah, north Euro, of medium. Uh, this is definitely a game you guys will want to check out. It's beautiful. It's from Game Brewer and Andres, Andreas Stedding. Again, the guy who made a Haunted Teutonica. If you guys have any questions about the game, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us. Follow us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook and everything else that we do. And we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.